the Gender Politics Podcast from the Heinrich Böll Foundation. People, you know, woke up after Trump's election, said, what is this country that we live in? This doesn't match what I had been thinking. Is not matched by the vote that has just been taken by the president that we have just elected. It was such a diverse crowd at the protest. It wasn't just young people. Mothers with their daughters, grandmothers as well, who could remember what it was like a long time ago when abortion was completely banned. Internet is not just online space where we have social media profiles. We need to take online spaces as something where we exercise our fundamental rights every single day. Women of all generations are taking to the streets and to social media to push for change. In fact, women are protesting in unprecedented numbers, using hashtags, pink hats and black umbrellas to fight for the world's attention. And they're remaking politics. I'm Abby Darcy, and welcome to the first of a new series of English podcasts from the Heinrich Böll Foundation, Our Voices, our choices. This series hands the microphone to people whose voices often go unheard or are censored, whose choices don't conform to laws or customs and are disregarded or denied. It's about people fighting to simply exercise their basic human rights and about the myriad ways communities worldwide are going about it. We discover how women are securing their rights through diverse political protest. We unpick the politics of women's reproductive rights and witness the trials of global LGBT communities struggling to get their rights recognised. This first podcast takes us to Kenya and Poland via the US, Pakistan and Germany. We meet suburban mothers and social media stars. This is about women and how they protest. There's been a tidal shift in US politics, and it didn't happen on social networks. There was no hashtag. It was barely even noticed by the media until it hit the midterms in 2018. And the unlikely leading lights of this political shift were suburban mothers and grandmothers. Hi, my name is Lara. I live in the yellow house down the street. I'm part of a citizens group here, and we're trying to build our own understanding of politics and how it's working and really ensure that everyone within our community has a better voice. We need your voice to be part of this. Lara Putnam is one of them, a mum and history professor in suburban Pittsburgh, and part of this unusual demographic propelled into grassroots political activism. People who found themselves, you know, woke up after Trump's election, said, what is this country that we live in? This doesn't match what I had been thinking was the trajectory of my country is not matched by the vote that has just been taken by the president that we've just elected. And then people in many cases joined with others within their neighborhood and said, what should we do? Or got together to charter a bus down to Washington, D.C. for the Women's March and said, OK, what do we do next? Uh, or talked on the bus on the way back from the Women's March saying, where do we go next with this spirit? The Women's Marches in 2017 were the biggest single day of protests the U.S. has ever seen. But it was the weeks and months afterwards that would prove decisive. The impact came in November 2018 with the results of the midterms. A record number of women were elected to the House of Representatives, moving it back into the hands of the Democrats. Women like me aren't supposed to run for office. I wasn't born to a wealthy or powerful family. Still waitressing just over a year ago to make ends meet, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was the youngest woman elected to Congress and a progressive, charismatic woman of colour from the Bronx. It was female voters who were instrumental in bringing greater diversity to US politics. What's fascinating is that the groups behind this shift weren't part of a national movement. It was small, local groups, often starting in pairs, working out of sitting rooms and libraries, knocking on doors and meeting people. Political participation, one might think, is driven by information and opinions, but actually all of our evidence is that actually political participation is driven by relationships. It's driven by context of relationships and dense connections. Knowing someone who supports a certain candidate has a very clear measurable impact because of that relationship that you have, because it's part of a fabric of connection. Your expectations for political participation are not shaped by sort of abstract information that you're getting out there through the media, it's really shaped by the expectations of people who are related to you within your own community. 
personal connections, word of mouth was the key. Unusually, what these groups really didn't rely on was social media. For women in Pakistan, social media is one of the most important available tools for protest. Idiot politician, yes, he politics करते हैं. I hate it. Kandil Baluch may be an extraordinary example. She had at least half a million followers, spoke out in videos for women's rights and against forced marriage, something she'd experienced herself. But she also outraged society by the way she dressed and spoke. It was too much for her brother, who later confessed to strangling her for bringing shame on the family. Internet is not just online space where we have social media profiles. We need to take online spaces as something where we exercise our fundamental rights every single day. Nikat Dad is a Pakistani lawyer and activist for women's rights and internet rights. For Pakistani women, social media is vital. She says a very powerful mouthpiece for free expression and for female protest. We need to see that who are the other people who are fighting battles while using these spaces. Maybe some someone living in the West or Europe or US. Maybe these spaces are very normal. But just take a moment and think about the people. in the developing countries or in repressive regimes where these spaces give freedom to people where they can actually breathe while they are online dad founded the digital rights foundation supporting victims of online violence she's no stranger to it herself and sometimes when she gets hate messages or death threats she'll keep a low profile for a while but not for long because for her that really isn't the solution She believes Pakistani women need to go on the offensive. I fight back, and I think we really need to realize our role not as a passive bystander, but actually speak up for others. Uh, while working with lots of women and girls, I have seen that we ourselves have internalized patriarchy and misogyny. When somebody harasses us or somebody victim blames us or body shames us, we feel that we deserve it. So it was very important for me to tell them that this is your right. This is the space that you have to reclaim. This is your own space, and free speech and access to information is basically your right. So we have been telling women that. how they can fight back they are not supposed to leave that space they are supposed to stay there and fight back no kind of protest forum is always for everyone my hashtag is of course it's not for everyone and that is totally fine <laughs> Anna Vitsorek lives in Berlin and on the internet she says she's an author and activist Late one night in 2014, a single tweet of hers kicked off a whole online protest movement. She was responding to a friend's story of sexual harassment, and then Vitsorik created the hashtag Aufschrei or outcry. When I went to sleep at like 4 a.m. in the morning or something, I was already thinking about okay, so next day when I wake up, how are we going to push this again? Because I was actually expecting it to die down of the rest of the night, but then in the morning it be- had become such a huge thing that basically my whole Twitter timeline was already talking about it. So that was definitely unexpected. In their thousands, German women started to share their stories of sexual violence. To strangers on social media, that it's unfiltered, it's often very raw. That is very powerful. I mean, I can tell from my experience with the Aufschrei, mostly helps others to find the courage to speak up as well. The problem is that it still takes a lot of courage to share these experiences. If we were living in a different kind of society, um, or according to a feminist vision, that wouldn't be. the case we wouldn't have to be afraid to speak up and to be shamed again to be attacked again although it still is very powerful in the moment because you also have a like, sort of an ad hoc community that builds itself up in this moment and that uh supports each other and is there for each other and yeah it helps you to to get through this as well Vitsorik's hashtag campaign created visibility and a forum for people to share their experiences but she's not content with it staying an online phenomenon with the me too movement the us has seen high profile figures held responsible for their actions 
In Germany, the impact has been less tangible. Vitoric wants to see more structural change. With the political climate that we're in right now and the far right gaining more momentum, uh, conservatives building alliances with the far right, it's even harder to ask for these kinds of educational models and societal changes. So as an activist, it's my role to be the one who says, well, I'm going to ask for these changes. I'm going to push for that. I'm going to bother you <laughs> uh, and talk about it until you cannot hear it anymore because that's what we have to do. I mean, you cannot just give up and demanding a life and a society where people can grow up without any kind of violence. There's nothing where we have to compromise and shouldn't be compromising. In many countries, social media has proven a highly effective tool to get the word out and get people onto the streets. My Dress My Choice started out in Kenya as a hashtag. In 2014, videos were going viral of women being stripped naked in public for wearing miniskirts. The attackers thought the women were dressing too provocatively. For women's groups in Nairobi, it was their first time organising a demo, and they looked first to social media to get support. Thousands of protesters showed up, marching to the bus stop where the first incident had happened, and then marching onto the courts. Naomi Mwaura was one of the organisers. We walked on the way to the Supreme Court. We met with the Chief Justice and we handed him our call for action. And we walked out with him to meet the public and the media. So later, the police investigated and they were able to catch the perpetrators. And then now we know who the, which public transport companies were involved in the scandal. The government followed it up and made an arrest. Also, the government passed a law making stripping, which is a form of violence. They made it punishable by 10 years. This experience led Mwaura to set up an NGO, pushing for greater structural change, improving awareness among employees in public transport, getting more women into transport jobs, and setting up Report It, Stop It to map incidences of sexual harassment. In contrast to Kenya, Poland has a very rich history of street protest. In 2016, the powerful combination of an offline and an unprecedented online campaign pushed a proposed abortion ban off the political agenda. A wide coalition of Polish NGOs, women's organisations and political groups collectively got the word out. On social media, the message went viral, inspiring huge numbers of Polish women to dress in black, take selfies and post them with the hashtag BlackProtest. Marta Titzner is an activist for the left-wing political party Razem. This wasn't just aimed at people in big cities, but at young girls who like to do selfies. After just one day, the hashtag had been posted 10 million times. It went far beyond all our expectations. A week later, there were 50 million posts. It was the most successful social media campaign ever in Poland. On October 3rd, 2016, women across Poland, dressed in black, walked out of work and protested through the streets against the bill banning abortion. With the help of social media, the protest drew a diverse crowd. Dominika Robluska, who worked for the think tank Krytyka Polityczna, remembers the day. It was such a diverse crowd at the protest. It wasn't just young people. Mothers with their daughters, grandmothers as well, who could remember what it was like a long time ago when abortion was completely banned. And our mothers who remembered the time under socialism when abortion was legal. I was so proud that we got so many people together. It wasn't just an online phenomenon. Women went out onto the streets and they inspired and convinced others to do the same. I felt a real sense of pride and I really wanted it to have an impact. That the government could not simply ignore this mass of women and men. And that's what happened. Three days after the protest, the Polish parliament rejected the proposed ban on abortion. Even the Catholic Church withdrew its support. It was a triumph for the collective power of online and offline protest. Yet the fight continues. In 2018, a new abortion bill was presented to the Polish parliament. Women across the world are still having to fight to access very basic human rights, the right to physical integrity and security. 
Individual protests can wield incredible power, their demands combining with powerful imagery and viral hashtags. But their goals are rarely reached with just one protest. It's mostly the start of a long struggle to sustain those first political gains and to keep their voices heard. I do hope you enjoyed this podcast. In the next ones, I'll take a closer look at the politics of women's bodies and their reproductive rights, and I'll discover how LGBT communities are struggling to secure their basic human rights. You can find this series and many more on iTunes, Spotify, Deezer or SoundCloud. Plus, there's more background on the issues you've heard here and much more about the work of the Heinrich Böll Foundation at böll.de. I'm Abby Darcy. Thanks for listening.